Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to the inaugural edition of Apollo Tires Sports Conflict. We have got together key stakeholders to discuss top three building blocks that are essential to becoming a sports playing nation. Community, technology, and know-how. I'm Vivek Sethia, the founder and CEO of India on Track. Our first panel for the day is Building Communities Through Sport. So, Aditi, you've given so much to football. Football's given so much to you. How do you see community? I feel that football brings the community together. Otherwise, you know, and I've seen it firsthand. I've seen where when I started playing football, there weren't, there were barely any any people who knew about football. And and to the time now, where you know we are being covered by the mainstream media, we are being highlighted and covered on social media. So it is definitely bringing the community together, a community of people supporting sports uh, and women in sports. For me, that's that's of course the the most important thing, um, and that is the reason why because I've seen all this happen. Uh, that is that is why I feel that as as a as as a as a role model, it is my responsibility to also contribute in the development of girls. and getting more girls to come out and play and for that to happen we need to have the parents of course that awareness needs to go on to the deeper roots involving the parents involving different people from the different parts of the community parts of the ecosystem the sports entire ecosystem because you know there has to be a pathway there has to be um an overall kind of support for the women in sports not just as mm. players but mm-hmm. also for girls to be involved in whatever sector they choose to be involved in and still stay involved as players because of course we have to realize and we have to understand that not everyone who plays the sport can play at the top level there there are a lot of other things that you learn from sports learn from football particularly um, that are very very important and uh, that can never be learned in the school in you know in in the books from the books so of course it it builds a community and uh, and the things that it can do and trans- how it transforms a person a girl especially for me a girl's personality what i've seen first hand uh, is extremely you know motivating and encouraging and that's what keeps me pushing to keep working on this particular uh, you know direction and keep in invo- getting more girls to come out and play how important is it for apollo tires as an as an organization to build community and what are some of the things you're doing around that Community building is is at the core, and you know, of everything that we've been doing over the last few years at Polo Tires uh, from a marketing perspective. Um, over the last few years, we've seen you know, share of mind move to the concept of share of heart, and the one way you can actually build share of heart is by engaging with your community. And what we do there is not try to change too much of what the community or our, in this case our target audience is doing, but interact and engage with them. in things that interest them so some of the things that we've done you know with the motor sports community is bad road buddies which is uh, you know encouraging the two wheeler suv audiences uh, on their weekend weekly drives etc to start at our um, at our dealers right and what we're doing there is nothing too different making sure our dealers start at 6 in the morning because there what we see is uh riders drivers need that morning cup of chai before everyone comes in together and they also need to make sure that their tires etc are you know serviced or checked before they go on that long ride so what we're doing is just delivering that small service for them and we've seen that community move to an apollo premise over the last couple of years where now rides uh and drives are organically starting uh at at the apollo premise and similar on similar route has been taken with rural sports where we've gone into rural markets which are again key to apollo but helped and supported them in the sports that are growing in that area while well, football is an important pillar for apollo uh, in our uh, journey uh, but we have not really pushed that agenda in markets such as for example kabaddi is big or volleyball is big and back to where football is big and important for us what we've done is uh, our grassroots program with man united you know we've built on that united we play and we've taken that to key markets and encouraged young football so these are Those are things that we've done, but uh, essentially it is it's, it's just going back to winning share of hearts and doing these things on an ongoing basis. It's about being authentic, uh, you know, uh, to the community and being credible in doing that. Parveen, from your perspective, when you look at a league which is uh, for a particular sport, community plays a, a rather critical role because you need that sporting community to come together, not just the players but athletes, also the fans, and so on. What is your view on this, and what are some of the things you are doing? 
Well, there's two aspects, of course, like Remis also mentioned. One is digital. And we've already built one of the largest digital uh, arm wrestling communities in the world. More than five lakh people on our Pro Punjali Facebook page. So wow. we've managed to do that over the last uh, uh, two years, which is growing and growing it across other social media platforms as well. The other is, of course, physical. And for that, what we're doing is we're using Sunday as a focal point of where people can come together, where they have time. You know, both the players, they have various, uh, 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 you can say, jobs and everything. So Sundays is a day they're free. So we're getting the players to also uh, grow the communities in their various areas. We're taking various spaces. We're putting uh, arm wrestling tables in various areas throughout the country. First, looking at, of course, the regions like uh, North, uh, East, you know, uh, South and central where it's more popular and growing it from there. We're putting tables in various places and we're getting the community to gather in these spaces. Well, I wouldn't say we're getting them, but we're giving them that opportunity to gather. It's, it's almost like a magnet. It's like an oasis that we're giving uh, an arm wrestling table and various other facilities for them to come together, to chat, to uh, you know socialize and come together on this uh, arm wrestling table. Because we do see the arm wrestling table, the Punjab table, as the biggest social tool because it is a great leveler. You know, we see the arm wrestling table as something that doesn't recognize religion, caste, anything. You know, on the table, everybody is equal. So that is how we're promoting it and building communities across the country. So, um, Abhijit, what are some of the guiding principles for you when you look at uh, success or how do you define success or what were the principles uh, that you used while you were creating this, the communities? First of all, brilliant question. Uh, the idea that we usually approach sports with when we are working with, a, uh, and in my instance, we work extensively with slum communities is that you're not going with a solution to a problem. You're offering a venue for the participants, for the players to come out and enjoy. So this mindset is one of the key uh, things that you go in with an approach that you're not providing a solution. This is just a, uh, just a platform. Uh, then considering the problems or the issues that that uh, uh, that community may face in our cases most of the time there's a lack of open space lack of safe spaces if you are going to build a program near a community that is underprivileged you need to also consider that there is a lack of mobility the children there cannot travel for more than a couple of kilometers and that too when you are selecting venues for uh, tryouts or uh, regular practices they can't be outside let's say a periphery we choose to be two kilometers because then that would mean additional financial mm -hmm. burden on the children also mm -hmm. lack of uh, lack of resources on parts of parents to actually allocate time and energy to bringing and dropping the child uh, these are some of the issues that we uh, have to consider when we decide to work in a community and apart, like again, as I say, that for us, the participation matters, not the sporting mm -hmm. impact of what we do. Uh, mm -hmm. We, however, uh, like uh, work alongside with several clubs who then happily pick up our good players and then they get a chance to keep going. So this pathway, uh, if we consider uh, ourselves at a place, we consider us at the base. And then mm -hmm. that helps us to uh, channelize the right uh, participants uh, upwards. Mm -hmm. I think just in interest of time, we'll have to end here. So thanks, everyone. Thank you again for the great uh, session, great inputs, and good luck, all of you guys, for your, for your endeavors. And I'll see you, see you all soon. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second panel discussion in the inaugural edition of Apollo Tire Sports Conclave. I'm Rashim Sharma. I'm a co-founder and I'm the chief marketing officer at India on Track. Um, and in this uh, particular panel, panel discussion, we're actually going to talk about the emergence of the digital playground. So as a rights holder in India, uh, what are the processes, uh, you know, what has been your process of adapting your strategy uh, to, to the digital landscape and engaging with your consumers? Um, Dheeraj, uh, um, so I think what the digital space has allowed uh, is uh, for you know, rights holders and for teams like yourselves to actually not just take it to a localized audience, but actually try and not just uh, make it global, you know, get into different countries, different kinds of consumers, because there are consumers of the product all over the globe now. Absolutely. Uh, and that's what we saw. I mean, three years back, our focus was only on in-stadia experience in, uh, you know, even, even when our sponsors came there, first thing was meet and greet with the players. How do you associate on the ground? How do you do stuff? when you're physically present. None of us ever imagined or even thought of 
a world where there would be no fans or a world where, uh, you know, especially cricket and of IPL and even international have fans in the stadium or even what, what the pandemic did was, oh, as, as they said, all our digital approach changed completely. Uh, we were lucky a few, I mean, a few, in 2020, we had a Nepali player. So we used, we used that's what, we, as you said, we built a really strong fan base in Nepal through our digital reach. We became stronger there. And it, it, the last two years, the complete focus and shift has been on uh, how do we access and get fans more involved with the team, as well as with the sport, as well as with, I mean, during our IPL matches, but digitally. So that, that's, I've seen that that's grown a lot. Uh, that's why all these platforms suddenly have taken a lot of prominence. Um, I mean, Akshay, thank you. He's one of our sponsors. He himself knows how we're trying really hard to, you know, get, get sponsors as well as the fans involved even while they're not there. And that's only happening because of the whole digital playground that, that we have access to. Akshat, I wanted to actually understand from you because uh, you're creating products that are uh, targeted to consumers uh, very specifically in the digital space. Uh, and I've read, you know, articles where you've spoken about how education um, can really benefit from uh, this kind of a revolution that's happened in the digital space. So, um, you know, give us a sense, share some of the insights that you have on consumer behavior that has helped you improve uh, your product and, and what you offer to the students out there. Sure, it's a great question. What we are seeing is uh, a lot of these technologies existed even before the pandemic. While edtech definitely got a lot of tailwinds, the technologies like AR, VR, adaptive learning, personalized learning, self-assessment, all of these were already there. Post-COVID, they've come into the mainstream. And as a result today, you're able to track each individual learner performance. For example, if I was a faculty member and there are 40 or 60 students in a class, it was very difficult for me to know who's learned or understood what particular concept. Today with technology, we are able to exactly pinpoint what is the learning, what is the skill set of each learner, and go back to the faculty to say, out of 40 students, these five have not really understood what you were teaching. We've got technology like eyeball tracking. You know, till about a year ago, it was unheard of. Or could you have exams like GMAT, SAT, sitting at home? And today, those are also happening online. The other big thing we are seeing, the change in learner behavior is, they also want gamification of learning. Nobody wants a, you know, that you're re repeating a physical classroom online. You can do so much more with AR, VR, Meta coming in, the way you can engage, how you gamify content, how you break people into teams. The learning is not, is not just limited to a learner anymore. By making people in groups, they could be sitting across, you know, they could be anywhere in the world, but you are one team, learn to work together. And with a different layer of gamification coming in, it just becomes a lot more fun. You know, earlier, what was your incentive or disincentive in teaching? You do well, you get marks. You don't do well, you'll get low marks and a scolding. <laughs> so, so rather than doing low marks and scolding as a disincentive, you've suddenly taken that and said, here, you're good at this, and, and you gamify and make fun of it. You know, imagine you're playing Mario. Whoever gets the question right, here you get a star in Mario and you go ahead. Or you can, simple things like that. So just positive reinforcement. I think that to me is the biggest change. Today, you don't need negative reinforcement. And you have a great blend of different technologies. I think India, to me, is what I look at the Goldie, uh, Goldilocks zone. Even before COVID, we had Geo, 4G, all of these were already there. And most people had a smartphone in their hand. Your internet speeds are ever increasing. And suddenly with COVID coming in, you've had an explosion of connected devices, which is, you know, whether it's learning, it's how you consume TV, how you engage. It's just... Um, all rolled into one. So we are at that very perfect, that Goldilocks stage for us, and we can leapfrog many generations. And I think when you talk about edtech or education, 
Yeah. I think India has an opportunity to be the edtech capital of the world. Akshat, uh, I know you're sitting on that gaming chair. We've <laughs> set the perfect, uh, perfect frame for that. I actually want you to weigh in on, on this as well because there's a lot of research and understanding that uh, you obviously um, have of the consumer in the digital space. What are they looking for? And you know, what what do you what kind of insight can you throw on on the consumer that uh, is in the digital space right now, consuming these products? So I've often gone and said something as simple as uh, habits don't change over over generations, right? And, I, and it's been one of my go-to comments. Uh, my grandmother, uh, she's alive. Uh, she tells me that her biggest problem with my mother was she was on the phone all the time. My mother had the same problem with me. I was on the phone all the time. I have the same problem with my daughter. She's on the phone all the time. Right? Think about it. And it's that it's it's such a it's a profound statement that that comes out of it, right? Yes, the phone had a wire and, and it was and there was two three phones connected to one line in different parts of the house. My phone, I had a problem because I was using it for dial-up internet at that time, and my daughter's got her own phone at seven years old to go ahead and play from watch. But the fundamental habit of what I call interactive entertainment, the phone versus a television, the old landline phone with a wire was interactive entertainment, right? You were talking to someone else live and having a conversation with it. I was also having a conversation live with another person, but using the dial-up internet line, and I was using that medium. And now my daughter is playing Roblox or, or Minecraft with someone else live. And entertainment over times has constantly been on an evolution of being interactive. And it's, it's this holy grail it keeps on trying to tend towards. Uh, we've, that's why Netflix is now going and saying, hey, we are going to do Bandersnatch and Black and another movie, uh, other shows that will be like games. They're, Netflix has now gone and said also that the biggest competitor to Netflix is Fortnite. Because what you're competing with is the six hours that people have to spend a day on entertainment. Now, it doesn't matter whether they're watching a La Liga match, whether they're watching a Delhi Capitals match, whether they're going and playing a video game with me, and they're watching, or they're watching an esports content which is there. It, it is fundamentally the time, the competition, and the real competition in the future is for a percentage of the six hours of wallet time that you have. Because that's it, right? You, you will go to school, you will go to college, you will go sleep, you will go ahead and do this. It's six hours a day, and that's why weekends work. Weekends work because you have now 15 hours that you can go in, but there's only 52 of them, right? And, and if you actually do the maths around it, you'll have maybe a thousand hours for, for a person in a year that you are actually just going competing for. That time, the more interactive you do it, the more dopamine flow you get it. And I'm, I know I'm being, they call me Professor Akshat, so I will, I'm actually going to go ahead and put on my full Professor Akshat hat by going and asking this. That is a dopamine flow. The dopamine flow is when you watch your team win, you get a hit of adrenaline and dopamine, which is that. And you want to go ahead and swipe up an Instagram story or a reel, uh, which is ever, you are getting a dopamine hit. Constantly interactive entertainment will try to go ahead and do this. And unless we as content creators and IP creators and, and value creators in the ecosystem, don't go ahead and address our fans who are constantly trying, who are on this gravy train of interactive entertainment, we will be left behind all the time. Jose, I'm, you know, like any other industry, uh, when it sees this sort of meteoric rise, there are always going to be advantages, uh, but there are also going to be pitfalls. You know, it's such a rapidly changing uh, and evolving platform um, that while it's exciting, um, it's also something of a bit of a minefield. You've got to be careful because your gratification is very instant but the brick bats are also extremely instant. So, um, you know, what do you see as sort of the advantages? Uh, maybe a couple of big ones and uh, probably the biggest pitfall uh, in this sort of very, very rapid rise of the platform. Well, I, I, I don't really think in pitfalls, no. I mean, we have a strange expression that says you cannot build gates to, into the fields. No, they are wide open. And uh, you cannot, uh, particularly when you have a, a surge of a new uh, uh, way of communication, because what that, that chat said is just right. If you are playing Fortnite, you are not watching the Liga, or you are not uh, 
uh, maybe listening to the Rolling Stones, well, maybe that, that you can. Uh, but you are we are all competing sort of for that space. Uh, but this is this is going to grow. Uh, so you have two two alternatives. Basically, if you uh, go to a strategic matrix, is either you try to lock yourself in the castle and defend yourself of this new wave. Or you take uh, your surf uh, board and go and uh, and surf the wave. That's what we are doing. Uh, of course, of course, maybe Fortnite is not that useful for us, but Electronic Arts FIFA it is, and it's a new way of communicating uh, to our fans. It's a new way of uh, of bringing new fans to the game. No, and and I was listening. Uh, this is all, all these interesting things, and at the end, at the end, football and cricket, it's been always an interactive thing, an engaging thing, even when we didn't use words. Because even today, when you go to the stadium, you're not going there like opera to sit and enjoy and judge what you see. You're going to participate. You're going to help your team win him, no? So uh, it, the interactive part is, being, is a natural part of... Uh, of big big sports, no. So we are trying to ride the uh, the wave. Uh, we are betting de uh, definitely in esports. We are organizing in Spain the biggest esports uh, e uh, foot around FIFA, no uh, uh, tournament. Uh, and uh, Akshay, you can forgive me. We are preparing together with Hero Byte. Uh, big news on esports that uh, we'll announce it on this Tuesday. No, so um, it is, uh, and this means that it's not all alone. No, it's about the fans, it's about the league itself, but it's about our partners. No, and working all together. And I think we all need to uh, learn to how to surf this wave, even those of us who come from a non-so digital tradition. Absolutely, I, I think uh, you've really put it very well, all of you gentlemen. Thank you so much. This has been a really fun conversation. Um, um, so I'm not gonna take uh, any more time from anybody else. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today uh, and sharing your thoughts on this. Thank you very much.